Sound sounds good on our end. All right, it's uh, 8.30, so let's go ahead and get started. I will call to order the meeting of the Legislative and Human Resources Committee of the Kent County Board of Commissioners. Uh, we are proceeding pursuant to MCL 15.263, small a, uh, in electronic format in order to protect the public health. Uh, if members of the public are attending and wish to participate in the public comment section, you may do so through this medium by raising your hand. That's using the uh, icon at the bottom of the Zoom uh, platform, or you may do so by sending in your comments through public comments at kentcountymi.gov, G-O-V. All right, let's go ahead then with the first item on the agenda, which is public comments. So is there anyone from the public that wishes to address the committee? Checking the inbox. Don't see anybody in the chat with hands raised and let's see. Doesn't look like there's any messages in the inbox. All right. Well, let's go ahead then to item number two, which is approval of the minutes from, <clears throat> excuse me, February 23, 2021. Is there a motion to approve? So move, Skaggs. Moved by Commissioner Skaggs. Support. support. Michelle Sup McLeod. Okay, support by Commissioner McLeod. Any discussion? This includes the uh, regular meeting and the work session. So if not, uh, those in favor signify by saying yes. 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 All right. I'll accept that as being approved. Great, let's move to item number three, which is a report from our federal lobbyists. It looks like uh, Steve Carey is on and Charlie DeWitt, both are here. So we get to have a, a double whammy, that's great. I'll uh, turn it over to you, Steve, and then you can uh, allocate your time as uh, between you and Charlie. Thank you, Chairman. And it's uh, great to address my home uh, uh, county. So thank you for this opportunity. Charlie and I are going to tag team this because this bill, uh, the stimulus bill that I think is, um, should be at the top of our agenda today uh, was so vast and it covered so many items, uh, we had to split it up. But we'll still just give you a summary today. And I did present uh, Lori just this morning with an update um, uh, in print. So um, perhaps shortly after we end, we will tighten that up and send it back to her to distribute to you. Um, so first of all, congratulations. Through your persistence, uh, I heard you loudly and clearly, and because of you directing me and other counties across the country, we finally uh, uh, are, are coming to a conclusion on this $1.9 trillion stimulus package, uh, of which $350 billion is provided to states, counties, and municipalities. And if the chart that I have uh, reviewed from one of the House committees is accurate, that tees up Kent County to receive $128.5 million. Um, the good news there too is that it provides flexibility in spending and uh, it allows the county to spend until December 31st of 2024. Um, so that should uh, give you a lot of comfort. I know that you needed that flexibility. And again, because of uh, Mr. Britt's direction, and of course, all of the, the commissioners and uh, chairman, your direction, uh, we pressed hard on that. I would ask, or, uh, ask you to consider uh, when this is signed into law, to dropping a note to a few people that we've engaged on Capitol Hill, just as a thank you for, for this, if you're inclined. Um, Chairman, we heard you loudly and clearly about behavioral health uh, needs to be addressed um, in, in this package and others. I recall very clearly about your interest in having a mobile uh, health unit to address mobile uh, or behavioral health. Uh, with that, uh, you'll be uh, glad to know that there's um, uh, significant funding block grants for community mental health programs. That was at a, a $1.5 billion, a block grant for uh, the prevention and treatment of substance abuse, uh, another $1.5 billion, and other programs to address mental health and substance abuse services. Um, there's also a, 
just shy of a half a billion dollars devoted to behavioral health clinics and so forth. That in addition to some of the other things that um, we you've probably uh, read or heard about over the past couple of weeks, the $1,400 stimulus uh, checks, um, uh, $400 million for homeless programs, and then of course the uh, $14 billion for vaccines. Um, Charlie, with that, uh, what did I uh, miss that the commission uh, committee would like to hear? Well, thanks, Steve. Yeah, there's a lot in that package. You've got $1.9 trillion, and of course, $350 billion of that goes directly to states, counties, and localities, and that's over 21% of the total funding. Uh, so there is a lot to go through in there. Not only it provides... Um, support services for things like mental health grants, it also provides a lot of services for firefighters, provides a lot of services for, for people who have been in the front lines of this uh, effort to uh, address the COVID um, uh, emergency crisis, including more relief for emergency services. And just one other thing I wanted to mention, um, this, this bill also includes a lot of capital projects relating to helping people uh, work, uh, provide education and health monitoring. These include a lot of technology services and remote options uh, that are part of this uh, whole process of dealing with the public health emergency. So, um, I, but, but I, I would like to say that um, there are a number of different specific issues that are in the bill and they have been broken down into their budget function and each authorizing committee has come forward to put their priorities in the bill. And I think a lot of those specific priorities may be of interest to uh, Kent County moving forward. And we can give you more details as we go through and we're happy to answer any questions. Uh, before we turn it over to uh, questions about just this package, Chairman, I'd like to tell you where we are in the process. It just passed this, the House passed it a number of days ago. The Senate modified it uh, on, and, and passed it on Saturday. And then it, the, the, those changes and the, the entire package came back over to the House side. And we expect that vote to take place um, uh, today. Uh, the speaker has reached out to her committee leadership to verify that there's nothing that uh, is a poison pill. And then once they process it here, uh, it will then go to the president for his, um, uh, his signature. Um, I wanted to address what's not in it because I know how important, uh, again, um, the uh, county administrator, Mr. Britt had emphasized and Lori had emphasized lead abatement programs and so forth. This is not an infrastructure bill. It's just to address the health needs and the shortfalls of, of governing bodies like yourselves. Um, the infrastructure is expected to be taken up uh, shortly after. They had anticipated that it would take place between April and May. I never thought that was a realistic uh, calendar. It's looking like uh, closer to July. Um, and so it will be those programs that will be in that bill. And that's why it's not in this measure. So just wanted to clarify that. Now with that, does anybody have any questions that uh, we could address? All right, well, thank you for that. Obviously a lot to cover here. So let's see what we have. Uh, Commissioner Ponstein, you had a question or comment. <clears throat> thank you, Chair Steck. So I'll start out by saying that sitting at my computer right now, if I started to count to a trillion, it'd take me over 12 years to get to a trillion. And that's a lot of money. And this is, I think we're on to 6 trillion now that we've pumped in under the name of COVID. How much money of this 1.9 trillion has nothing to do with the COVID? And, now, and secondly, now that we're at 30 trillion in our national debt, when is Congress gonna get serious about that? Because that's gonna have bigger ramifications for counties and local governments if we can't pay that debt down and the, our credit ratings for the federal government start to go down. All good questions. Yeah. I'm if we sorry. could get the short, if we could get the short answer to those. <laughs> okay. All great questions. Because I'm sure that that would take us days. 
it, well, it, it, they're all good questions and they were all yeah. items that were debated on the floor and in committees. Um, they, the, the, the the House and Senate did um, believe that most, if not all, of the uh, funding in these bills were directly related to COVID as a re result of um, uh, the economic downfall and so forth. Um, it just depends on uh, some of the scoring, for sure. There were some, as I recall, uh, a couple of comments on Capitol Hill saying this is not a perfect bill, but it's good. Um, as far as that debt goes, uh, you and I share the same concern. I think that that concern is shared by many. Um, and if in fact the, the uh, trajectory holds, we will be at a debt ratio to GDP by 2050, and that's not sustainable. There was an argument though, Commissioner, that if we didn't um, keep the economy going through federal support, that it would have taken us uh, a five times more to regrow organically. Uh, I'm not an economist. I'm just conveying to you uh, the arguments on both sides, but debt is certainly a, a, a scary um, issue that will be haunting us. And it is our hope, uh, everybody's hope that the economy will, will grow uh, once we're out of this crisis. So you, you had mentioned the uh, infrastructure then, uh, how many trillion are they planning to spend on that? I, I can't give you a figure, and I think that that's the uh, that's one of the holdups. Um, in the previous administration, they uh, proposed two different versions, uh, none of which were appealing to the Republicans or Democrats because they didn't um, uh, have offsets um, other than uh, privatizing many of the roads and, and highways and bridges, and that to even Republicans was a non-starter. Um, I know that there's been some discussion about gas taxes and so forth, but that would not then address the number of uh, growing number of um, um, electric vehicles. So they've got a task in front of them for sure, Commissioner. Uh, I, a lot of these things will play out and I will report and never hesitate to reach out to me as we go down this path. Steve, may I add just a thought? Please. Uh, the question is how much is, uh, as to the question of how much is actually going to COVID relief or to, to the COVID uh, itself, I would say specifically, if you're asking that, it's 75 million that are going to, 75 billion rather, to COVID vaccines and tracing and testing and all that. Another 7.6 billion are going to hire 100,000 health workers. Uh, but a lot of this package um, and I mentioned before, 21.4% is going towards state and local governments, but a lot of the package will be going towards stimulus checks. And that has been pared down a bit. I think that's a disappointment to a lot of people as far as a $1,400 per person checks. And part of that is also going to unemployment insurance, uh, guaranteeing that $300 will be, uh, will be part of the benefit until September. A lot of people wanted more than that. Uh, but that's a that's a big chunk of it right there. So I, I, I would say that you're, you're right. It is a big, a big amount. And um, it's, uh, you know, there may be, it, there is a debate right now about how much this will impact inflation going forward and how it will be paid for. Mr. Chairman, back to you. Any other questions or yes. comments? Yes, sir. Commissioner, Commissioner Skaggs has a question. Thank you, Chair. Just uh, two quick questions to return us to our role as county commissioners. Um, number one, uh, some federal money has been flowing through the state, and that has led to some coming up of the works between the executive and legislative branches. Is this money going to flow directly to Kent County, or does it have to pass through state government, and therefore um, we may run into some difficulties? The 128.5 uh, million is is direct to the county. Uh, the the other uh, five billion through the state uh, that's going to the state. There will obviously uh, they they will be in charge of that funding and how it's distributed. But that 128.5 is yours. Okay, great. So secondly, just about you know where we can spend this money. There were a lot of uh, restrictions timelines and deadlines on on the CARES money. 
Um, and we used a lot of that money uh, for small business relief to deal with homelessness, uh, to help fund our health department through the crisis, um, et cetera. Um, it sounds like many of those things are going to be funded directly from the feds. Um, so, you know, to the extent that you know what we spent our CARES task force money on, um, are we encouraged or expected to, uh, to continue with things like small business relief and health department funding, uh, or can this money be used with some wide latitude? It's a great question, Commissioner. Um, uh, we, there is not a, a concrete answer yet. Uh, as you uh, know, uh, when bills are signed into law, then the agencies uh, need to interpret them and get that. They do want to get a, a lot of this money out the door fairly quickly. But I can just say as an example, I'm aware that, say, uh, Cherry Street Health, uh, whom you may uh, assist, uh, they, through the, uh, this bill, will uh, receive approximately you know, their share of a distribution of $7.6 uh, uh, billion dollars in support for all community health centers across the country. So as this all rolls out, there probably will need to be some sort of coordination. Uh, but I would also like Charlie uh, to, to weigh in on this. Charlie, what am I well, missing? That is a, a, a important thing you bring up, Steve. And of course we have to wait for Treasury Department to bring out their guidelines on how it can be spent. But a, a, a main provision of this bill is to make it is to make sure that there is much more flexibility and leeway in how the funds are gonna be spent with respect to uh, providing aid to small businesses, households, nonprofits, as well as, as industries uh, such as tourism, travel, hospitality, hotels, as well as infrastructure investment. And that's that of course has to be built into the guidance that the treasury department brings out, but that is uh, the top of the list as far as the uh, new flexibility and the allowable use of funds uh, in addition to other investments like water, sewer, or broadband infrastructure and a whole host of other areas where it will be allowed. Um, so there, uh, there's more on that we can talk about, but we'd be happy to follow up on that question. Yeah, wonderful. Thank you so much, gentlemen. I think, um, you know, one of the problems with CARES is we kept getting delayed or contradictory uh, statements from Treasury and, uh, you know, other federal institutions. And, you know, so as you continue your work on our behalf, which is very much appreciated, you know, if you could, you know, on some level, let's get it right, um, but let's also not delay so, so much and uh, get some clear guidance to us about what we can spend this money on. So uh, thanks for your work on this uh, and uh, thank you, Chair. All right, thank you. Commissioner, yeah, I don't see any others right now, so maybe I'll just take the opportunity to drill down a little bit from Commissioner Skaggs' um, questions. Is the 128.5 uh, your calculation based on an assessment of a formula, or is that set in stone? It's uh, based on an, uh, a formula that um, the House and Senate agreed to, and it um, I, I uh, obtained that um figure through a chart that was produced by the Government Reform and Oversight Committee. Um, it had a breakdown of every state, every county. Uh, Charlie, I'm not sure if, if you've got that handy. Uh, let's just make sure that we get that back in the hands of, uh, of, of uh, Lori and uh, yeah. Mr. Brett and, and the commission who asks. Um, yeah, but but I, I will say this. It's a good it's a good question. It, we we saw it, uh, but even seeing things doesn't mean that um, uh, it's 100 um, percent. And to uh, Commissioner Skagg's point, I can't uh, guarantee that things don't gum, get gummed up. I, it's just uh, I, when I was in the Marine Corps, it's that hurry up and wait kind of thing. And um, it's the, the bureaucracy and they climb all over each other. I do want to warn everybody about that. Just as a, as a citizen, it's been my perspective that you know things take time. Um, um, uh, Mr. Chairman, that figure though, uh, if you can find that, Charlie, and get that to 
the chairman. And yeah, he can and see. I, okay. I, I would add just a, as a thought on that, uh, Steve, is that you're looking at um, each state is allotted a different amount based on their level of unemployment. And I think the per capita amount that each um, resident of Michigan gets would be about $1,011. And what I understand is uh, this, this um, formula that they use um, might have an impact for, you know, bigger impact for states with a higher unemployment level. For example, New York is going to get more funding than the state of Florida, even though their population is slightly less than Florida because of the higher unemployment uh, issues that are they're experiencing in New York State. Okay. So just the other side of that, any projections as to when this money would be released, assuming that it is signed next day or so? Well, may I the, comment on that, Steve? Please, Charlie, yes. Well, I, I, it would be available immediately. And that's one of the things that, uh, that they're trying to build into this legislation is that they want to expedite the funds to get out there. And it would be paid out in tranches. So you would have to, you would be able to apply for the funds immediately. Um, and the Treasury Department would have 60 days to disperse those funds from my understanding of, of the legislation. So they are trying to expedite um, payments to local governments um, to be paid out again in two tranches. When those tranches will happen, I, I think it, there, it depends on a number of factors, but that's something where we can definitely follow up with you more information on that. Okay. Well, I'm sure there'll be a lot more information and details emanating out of Washington over the next few weeks, but so good. Any other questions? Uh, if not, uh, thank you so much, Steve and Charlie, for your um, ability to assess uh, a huge volume of data in a short period of time and to give us a, um, an update on uh, where we're heading with that. So I uh, look forward to hearing some of these uh, detailed responses back, and we'll disseminate that information when we get it. So thank you so much. Thank you, Chairman. Thank you, everybody. It's a, it's a privilege and a pleasure. All right, let's move to the next item on our agenda, which is a performance measurement review from our prosecutor. And I see Chris is on the line. So Chris, I will turn it over to you. Good morning. Good morning, can you hear me okay? We can. All right, well, I'm trying to share my screen. Uh, let's see if I can do this. Hopefully you can see Looks what good. I'm about to. So can you see my, I got a strategic yes. point there. Wow, this is going crazy. It actually works. You know, I'm never, never quite <laughs> sure. I uh, appreciate the opportunity to talk to you today. Um, got a lot of things we're going to go over here, but trying to start off with, you know, the strategic uh, performance. And one of the things I've been trying to do as uh, elected prosecutor is this community outreach. And I've got some photos here when, you know, obviously before COVID hit. Um, that was one of the things we were really trying to do because every time you meet a prosecutor, the first words out of somebody's mouth is, oh, I didn't do it, or I don't want to meet you, um, because I think everybody's got the idea that our sole purpose is to send people to prison, and that's what we're here for. And it's really not. You know, we were here to keep the you know, Kent County safe and, and, and really work with the community to, to prevent crime, if at all possible. So I think community outreach is something we really tried to do. So these are some examples of you know, things we did. You know, Monica and I on the left here on mine. We got our pinwheels for prevention. You know, there's a child abuse, uh, child abuse pinwheels for prevention. You get involved in those and put it out on Facebook and, and try and engage the community that way. On uh, the bottom right, uh, Michelle Smith Lowe was one is my uh, senior attorney in the family division. She won a Giants Award, and so we got the you know, members of the office to go out and, and participate in the Giants Award when she received that very prestigious award for her involvement and her her, her work in the African American community. Uh, then the Human Trafficking Task Force, the top one, you know, going on panels and talking about these things and try, trying to engage. You know, we do rock the block. We go out and, and get involved in the community to try and change the perception of, of what prosecutors are and what prosecutors do on a regular basis, because I think that there's just a misnomer of what our office is all about. And so, you know, that's not necessarily uh, something you can measure or something you can really put a, a, a number on, but that's something we really tried to focus on before the pandemic. And as we come out of it, I think it's we're going to try and do it as well. We've already done a few things at the Hispanic Center 
uh, trying to outreach the, the Hispanic community because there's a very there's a hesitancy to come forward and report crime because they're worried about what's going to happen to them. And so trying to engage these uh, communities and vulnerable communities too is something I'm really trying to work on. But when we look at, you know, I tried to pattern this after some of your strategic uh, plan uh, that you put out last year and focus on two specific ones here. And the first one is priority three. When you look at maximize efficiency and provide exceptional service, I thought that was the thing that jumped out to me uh, when thinking about what this office does. And I, I say that because I'm going to put up a, a number here. This is a, the Prosecuting Attorneys Association of Michigan sends us a survey just about every year. And they ask us just basic numbers, you know, how many prosecutors you have and so forth. And you can see the reports. Now, for whatever reason, Wayne, Wayne's usually a part of it. Oakland seceded from Pam years ago. I don't know why the prosecutor there didn't like what was going on or something. Wayne's usually there, but we at least have numbers of our comparable um, counties. You look at Macomb, Kent, Genesee, Washtenaw, and it shows population. You know, Macomb is about 842,000. They have 56 prosecutors. Jumping down to Genesee, the next one below us, you know, 422 uh, thousand population ballpark and they have actually more prosecutors than we do 36 we're, we're at about 35 so what does that mean when i when i start to break this down when you look at it just at a pure okay one prosecutor per how many residents count is about sixteen thousand, almost seventeen thousand uh, uh people are represented by a prosecutor which if you look at the comparable uh counties in the state of michigan Michigan, you know, we're well above everybody. Macomb's the next closest at about 14,000. So you talk about efficiency of service. I think you're getting, we're, we're delivering services efficiently. Uh, you're getting a, a good amount for the, the money you're spending on our prosecutors. But I want to you know, dig a little bit deeper. And I bring up uh, Michigan Indigenous Defense. And Indigenous Defense is something that, you know, we support as prosecutors, surprisingly, because we want good, we want a competent defense attorney. We want people to be represented. Our job, once again, is not to put people in prison. We want to make sure people are represented fairly. The defendant gets a fair trial, but we're zealously representing the victims. Well, Indigenous Defense has got a ton of money from the state. And I know you've been, most of the county commissioners have been involved in that. And we're not saying anything against that. And I know Craig Paul has worked very hard on that. But if you look at that number down there in red, the, the indigent defense should not exceed the caseload numbers, 150 felonies or 400 traffic misdemeanors per year. That's what they're saying for indigent people who, you know, who are representing those who can't afford their own attorney. But what does that mean for us? Hey, okay, let's take a look at Kent County. When you break down my office, we have 21 criminal APAs. You know, I have an office about 35, but 21 are specifically working in criminal. Last year, we just got these numbers in, we issued about 10,500 cases, right? That doesn't take into account, we also, we're the gatekeeper. So we deny about 4,000 cases a year. So we, you know, defense attorneys, you know, kind of take what we give them because if we don't charge, they're usually not getting involved too much. So we're screening those. So we're about, you know, 14,000, 15,000 cases we're looking at a year. We charge 10,000. When you break that down, that's 500 cases of prosecutor. Okay, we're well above what that indigent defense level is. Now, is that exactly a true number? Does every 21 prosecutors have 500 cases? No, because what happens is right now in my district courts, where district courts are handling your misdemeanors, for example, 61st has six judges. Well, I have two prosecutors assigned to six judges. Now, that's that's a lot of work, and uh, you know, but, but those misdemeanor cases are also less involved. You know, a drunk driving trial may have three witnesses. They you know they don't take the same amount as felonies. So that number is, you know, boosted up. But if you look at my circuit court attorneys, circuit court are dealing with the felony cases. They're averaging anywhere between 180 and 210 cases, uh, felony cases, felony cases. That's that's a that's a good amount. That's a lot of work. And that's above what you, know, you almost see what they're recommending for indigent defense. You look at my juvenile division, juvenile division, when you look at those numbers, 1600 delinquency cases, delinquency cases are juveniles committing crimes. All right. So, but for the fact they're not old enough to be charging adults, but also a part of that, we have a contract with the Michigan Department of Health and Human Services to handle neglect cases, parental termination. We may terminate parental rights. Um, we are involved in making sure kids are staying safe. We have about another thousand cases of those. So my juvenile are handling about 377 cases per assistant prosecutor. That's a, that's a tremendous caseload. Uh, across the board on the and those are very difficult cases when you're talking about terminating parental rights that's a you know that's as serious if not more serious than what goes on in the criminal division my family law uh, a lot of people don't necessarily realize our family law division is responsible for child support establishing paternity and then getting child support orders set up to pass along to front of the court 
well, four prosecutors handling 2,000 cases, over 2,000 cases, that's about almost you know 600 cases per prosecutor over there working in the child support division. And then finally, I guess, you know, I kind of joke with Jim Benison, the head of my division there, you know, that my appeals people, well, they're, they're, the, they're the slackers. They're only handling about 127 cases. But in that sense, you know, 508 cases, the appeals have a tremendous, it's almost more involved because they're handling, you know, somebody gets convicted, a five-day trial could have transcripts for, you know, six, you know, thousand pages. And they got to read those transcripts and then write a brief to the, uh, you know, Supreme Court Court of Appeals. So that's a, a, an amazing amount of involved work. So when you look at efficiency of delivery, I think you're getting a lot of work out of these prosecutors. And, and please don't take this as I'm, I'm not begging for more prosecutors. That's not going to be the pitch at the end here. Okay, I think we're doing a good job. We have a very experienced office. We're able to stand on top of these cases and they know what they're doing. They're very dedicated to their jobs. So we are handling things and, and we are providing good service. And these are some of the extras, if you will. So we charge those, we charge all those cases when you look at the treatment courts, and once again, we're very supportive of our treatment courts, and these are the treatment courts we have across the county, but we have to assign a prosecutor to be. Every treatment court model says a prosecutor's got to be involved. They're a gatekeeper, if you will, and then they also have to weigh in on what we should do when these people get in. So you look at there's two sobriety courts, a drug court, a veterans court, the mental health treatment court. We started the YSOTP court. Now, we, I think you guys just approved uh, funding from the state, uh, kind of a pass through. We got a grant thanks to Representative LeGrand. Um, that is, you know, that's a new thing. Nobody's doing that in, in, in the state, YSOTP. But these are extra things that we're doing on top of approving warrants, on top of the handling of those 10,000 cases that we've got to go and devote time and energy and effort to participate in those courts. And I know one of the big things from funding wise from PAM, the Prosecuting Attorneys Association, is courts get funding, prosecutors don't get funding, and we're just as important and just as participant in those treatment courts. And so that's one of the things, you know, we're looking at it from a, a statewide issue is trying to get prosecutors funding for participating in these treatment courts because they are very important. And we're looking to expand them and, and, and work on them. But we also need the funding to be able to participate in them because they're a, a tremendous uh, burden, if you will, to an office and the manpower. So in terms of, you know, you can be efficient as you want, but if you're not responsive to what's going on, that doesn't help really, right? So I take this year, this year obviously was a crazy year with COVID um, and I bring this, this is one cell phone stores. If you look at these dates here on, that I have here, May, May and June were absolutely the nuttiest thing I've ever seen as a prosecutor in terms of cell phone store break-ins and cars. And we had to respond to that. And this is just, this is one car and you see there's eight instances of this one car. We'll multiply that by 15 similar cars. And the next slide shows you this. This is, you know, the month of June 40 stolen vehicles from all over, you know, all over, not, you know, Grand Rapids, Wyoming. We, we had a, a summit, if you will, between, it was Macosta County, Ottawa County, Muskegon. Um, it was, you know, all across the state. We're convened at the Sheriff's Department here in Kent County because of the rash of car break-ins at dealerships and brazen, driving through, driving through car dealership windows to steal cars. And then they use those cars to commit uh, cell phone store break-ins. So we were able to respond. I assigned, you know, on top of everything else, got two prosecutors to kind of work on a task force to look at, okay, how are we going to, what are we going to do with these kids and adults? It was kids, it was juveniles and adults. So that's why I had two prosecutors, one from our juvenile division, one from my adult criminal division to try and coordinate how we respond with the other law enforcement agencies in Kent County and through the state. So to be able to respond to unique things, you know, unique things, we never predicted this. And when you talk about performance measurements, I'm always, I kind of push back when they came to us saying, okay, this is our goal. We can't have a goal. We're going to, you know, we're going to write 6,000 warrants or 10,000 warrants because it's just like, you know, a police officer trying to, well, you got to get a quota for tickets. We can't do that. We are bound by what's going to come to us and nobody ever predicted anything like this. So we were able to respond even to these rather unique and challenging times to provide assistance to work on these cases. And, and it's not just car dealerships and, and stuff like that. They got, you know, dangerous things. And if you remember, this was during uh, right around the time of George Floyd and the protests as well, we were very concerned. So it wasn't just prosecuting. We can't prosecute our way out of this. And then you have these instances where somebody dies because of a car accident and, and, and somebody's fleeing the police. We were worried about there was going to be a shooting here in, in Kent County. So well, we convened, Commissioner Womack was one of the people that came in. We convened community leaders to talk about this and say, hey, we need to reach out to these kids and say, hey, we need to stop this. And it's gone down. I mean, it's, it didn't go away completely, but it's a heck of a lot better 
better now than it was, you know, back in, in May and June. And we were able to react and provide good service and, and not only prosecute, we charge people, but also try and go out there and prevent it and trying to reach out to the community and say, hey, we need to do something better and do something more here. So the next priority, if you will, and it kind of ties into somewhat when you look at your strategic plan is, you know, a high quality of life that promotes safe and healthy communities. Well, well safe and healthy communities is, is once again, something I think we have an impact on. And unfortunately, this was a, a bad year. Um, and, and to some extent, you know, Grand Rapids is a focal point. And I was, I, I happened to be in one of the, you know, joined in the Zoom meeting where you had the West Michigan Sports Commission, you know, give their presentation. I think there's a downtown development. Well, when, you know, outside people are looking to come in and be a part of Kent County and maybe come here as part of a sporting event, you know, that's, this is what you kind of see sometimes. Um, I did a number of interviews. Is Grand, is Grand Rapids safe? And, and Grand Rapids is safe. We had a horrible year, um, but it wasn't just Grand Rapids, you know, Wyoming, Kentwood, they saw there are a number of homicides go up this year. So once again, we have to react because keeping a safe community is something that's of utmost importance, importance to how this community is viewed and how the economic development goes as well. So just looking at Grand Rapids alone from 2020, there's 11 that are, remain unsolved, okay? But out of those, we didn't charge because almost a scarier thing is five of those were self-defense in terms of, I, you know, we reviewed them and said, we can't charge because somebody shot it, started shooting, the other person shot back and killed them. That's self-defense. You know, that just shows you kind of you know, some of the guns that are out there, which is a little bit concerning. But from that, my, you know, 21 criminal APAs, 17 of them have at least one homicide charge right now. And homicides are very work intensive. And most of them have multiple homicides. I mean, more than one. So that's, that's a heavy burden on what they're doing. And when I talk about 13 in the investigative subpoena stage, a lot of those that we solved in the investigative subpoena stage are work intensive. And that's a different procedure. It used to be, you know, kind of in the old days, you know, police investigated, they present the case to the prosecutor's office, and we decided to issue or not issue. Well, we're, there's, you know, obviously some tension between, you know, people don't want to cooperate with the police. So we're forced to issue what's called an investigative subpoena, where we subpoena people in, bring them into court, put them under oath, there's no judge, there's no jury. And then if they lie, we're able, we charge them with perjury. And then if they, once they're charged with perjury, they all of a sudden become much more truthful, if you will. And we're building cases like that. We use them uh, quite a bit in many of our homicides. It's very rare almost. We just had one yesterday. I charged one yesterday where we actually had the homicide happened on March 7th. We were able to write it March 8th because we had witnesses that talked to the police and told them what happened. And we were able to write it. That doesn't happen anymore. We're taking months, if not years, for investigation. So if you look at it, I think we had total charge. Total charge. We've charged 38 homicides. Now, 38 homicides, that means we've gone back. We've charged some from 2019 because they've been in this investigative subpoena stage, bringing witnesses in for over a year. You know, one of those was a fish ladder. There was the 4th of July, the fish ladder downtown. We charged that members out of that homicide this year because the investigation took so long. So it's very work intensive for this office, getting subpoenas out, scheduling court time on top of everything else that's going on. But it's very important because holding people accountable for crimes like this is tremendously important. And to mention that, you know, this is probably maybe, you know, you know to somewhat a feather in our cap, not our cap, but also the sheriff's department. You know, this is a 2006 homicide. We charged it last year. So that goes part of the 38 homicide. But this was a 2006 homicide that we're finally able to crack last year using investigative subpoenas happened up in Rockford. Um, but our office and the sheriff devoted, you know, a couple detectives. I had two prosecutors assigned to work on this cold case to be able to bring justice for somebody that was killed, you know, in 2006. And so stuff like that, being able to, you know, react and, and handle these types of cases, even with everything going on, I, I think is a, a tremendous benefit. And you're getting a, a lot of, you know, benefit from our, our, our assistant prosecutors in this type of stuff. But it's not just it, that, you know, prosecuting is not all we do. Talking about, you know, what we're doing in juvenile, we're working right now with MDHHS, uh, blind removal. There is an overrepresentation of kids of color being removed from their parents. And uh, that's concerning. That's a major event to remove a kid, even for a short period. You know, this is not talking about every termination. That's just, you know, removing them because there's issues in the home that they, and, and then trying to work back. And, and the vast majority of cases do able to put those kids back. But we took a look at, okay, what can we do differently? And we're doing a blind removal where they remove any sort of, you know, you know, whether it be, you know, race characteristics, something that would tip off and trying to look at that purely. Okay. Are we making the right decision here? Uh, for what we're doing when we're removing these kids from a home because it's such a, a serious instance. 
Uh, Hillary Baker is one of my uh, assistants over in family division. She was instrumental in trying to get Aquinas College to bring this child advocacy program, to train the next generation of CPS workers to get better responses, to make sure CPS, you know, we can, we can invest to some say, but we rely on police, we rely on, on CPS investigators as well. So she brought in a program to really train and get involved to the, the new generation of CPS people so they are able to respond appropriately at moving down the road. And the juvenile mental health court, you know, once again, working with uh, the courts, uh, we have a mental health court for adults where they're doing the same thing for juveniles to get those juveniles the appropriate treatment to get them on the right track especially in the juvenile. If we can get the juvenile on the right track, we don't see them as adults. We save prison costs, we save jail costs. You know, we get that person to be a productive member of society. And if the younger we can do it, the better it is. Uh, going back to those uh, child, the, the, the cell phone stores and the, the car thefts, it gets 14 years old. There's a number of 14, 14, 15 year olds involved in multiple car thefts. I mean, that's, they're starting behind. You know, we can't let that happen. And if we can get people mental health treatment and get them appropriate supports earlier, we don't see them as adults because once you get to adults, it gets a lot worse and a lot harder to do. So that's what we're doing in the juvenile system. You know, our family law, once again, getting kids the proper support, getting them payment um, so they can, you know, buy food, they can go to school, they can do those things that are necessary. Uh, we are doing an excellent job over there. We get a case from the Office of Child Support within 14 days, 96% of those cases, you know, we're, we're, we're starting them. We're opening a case, getting them moved on, right? Uh, this is well above the federal guidelines. We have federal guidelines, and I think the federal guidelines are around 75%. Locating, trying to find the non-custodial parent every 60 days, we're at 90% of the time. And that's, a, that's an involved process because we get some bad addresses from Office of Child Support. So we go out and try and find them, we can't find them. That becomes incumbent upon us to try and, okay, look at other, you know, aid they're getting, credit cards, where are their addresses. We've got to try and find them to get them served, to get them in to try and establish paternity. And maybe the bottom line, the, the, the final orders enter. That means we've got both parents in. We've talked about to the dad saying how much you, they say dad, generally it's, a, it's the dad that's a non-custodial parent, but not all the time. But hey, how much can you pay? What's your, what's, what other obligations you have? We're getting orders established 87% of the cases that are the final order. So that's, those are well above the federal guidelines. So we're getting the kids the support they need to hopefully get a healthy start on life. And I think that's the most important thing. Um, the future, uh, that, that little guy down the bottom, that is us. The tidal wave is waiting for the courts to open up. Um, we're somewhat terrified. Uh, we have not had a jury trial in Kent County since March of last year. So they that we had one. We had one a district court case in Kent was able to go sometime around September. Other than that, all the cases have backed up. I did a kind of informal asking my APAs, how many cases are we looking at that you're, you, you know, not just a sign that are kind of waiting past settlement conference, haven't pled there. They said 900 or about 950 cases. Uh, and that, you know, the 38 murders we've charged are just sitting there. You know, we average about, it says, you know, 55 to 75 trials a year. And you think, well, that's not that bad. But for every one of those trials that go, there's probably five that resolve. Without the jury trials, those trials have not resolved at all. They're just backing up. They're stacking up like cordwood. District courts are moving in terms of we're getting those homicides through the preliminary stages. We've been we've been having court pretty much since you know April and moving cases through and getting preliminary hearings done. But trials are stacking up and defendants are not pleading because they think, well, we're going to get a better deal when this backlog is going to happen. And that's something I'm trying to say. No, you know, I'm not going to. You know, people are pleading, and why should we hold people differently here than while well, the people who took advantage. So I'm telling my APAs, get your discovery out, give the best offers you can now, uh, because it's going to be a backlog, but we want to you know, hold people accountable. So this is what we're looking at. And then we just ran our numbers and this is not my best slide, but we just, you know, you look at the difference. This is, this was quite stunning to me because essentially April, March through April, we were beyond skeleton. There was a couple people in here reviewing warrants and, and nothing much was going on. We were seeing a ton of domestics. So to have 10,000 charges, see that sort of increase in terms of the authorized charges versus you know last year was quite stunning. So all those cases, a lot of them were just backing up. So we're just waiting. We're looking at maybe May, June to start jury trials again, um, and how we're going to deal with that. We're going to we're gonna, we'll deal with it, um, but it's going to take some time. It's not like something we're going to solve by just having a bunch of trials in, in, in two weeks. It's going to take you know over a year uh, by best estimate. So that's kind of you know my presentation. Uh, I hope you have any questions, and I'll be happy to answer them.
Yes, thank you, Chris. Let's see if we have any questions or comments from commissioners. I see Commissioner Ponstein has a uh, question or comment. Thank you, Prosecutor Becker, for being here today. It looks like your plate is plenty full. I just want to have you comment. You mentioned this in your opening remarks, and it seems to be a problem that's in the headlines all the time, and that's human trafficking. And people I talk to in the community, a lot of them think, well, you know, that stuff doesn't happen here. That happens in the big cities there and here. Um, I mean, how, I mean, do we have a problem? Is it something that we need to be concerned about? I mean, is it the fact that maybe people aren't aware that it is a problem? And, and what's even more disturbing is that, you know, there is still a high demand for this type of uh, uh, issue in this country. It's just, you know, heartbreaking. It's a combination of a little bit of everything. Yeah, we do it. There is an issue. There is a problem. And, and we're very fortunate. We have C uh, Solutions to Exploitation. It's an organization based in Grand Rapids that's very proactive. And they just got a grant from the federal government to start working with Kent ISD to raise awareness, kind of like going to you, people aren't aware of it, to, you know, train the school workers to raise awareness with the kids about, you know, some of the keys. But it's a, you know, we don't have to make cases. We don't charge cases because people, they don't come forward. You know, I was saying you discover a human trafficking case and we had, we had actually had one this year out of Grand Rapids. They came across it. They got a report of a, a house. I mean, all the classic things, there was multiple women staying there. I mean, condoms are over the, all over the place. The, one of the girls escaped, called the police on the run and reported it. We were able to charge, but we could never get that girl back to testify. Everybody fled because you have the aspects, you have an aspect of domestic violence because a lot of these girls are vulnerable girls who are being trafficked and they view their trafficker as somebody they love, who cares for them, who they want to support, and they don't want to, they don't want to, you know, prosecute them. They think they're their friend or their lover or whatever. And so they're a very difficult nut to crack. So when you look at the numbers, we don't charge a ton, but it's out there, to, you know, how prevalent is is always try, tough to measure too because people aren't coming forward and the, the, the victims don't think they're victims. So it, it's a multi, very difficult case, but it, it definitely happens in Grand Rapids and, and we're working on it and it's out there. So it's part raising awareness and part trying to break the cycle, much like domestic violence. All right, uh, Commissioner Legrand. Thank you, Chair. Uh, thank you for that really interesting report. I kind of want to tie it back to the uh, to the COVID money that we talked about earlier from our um, our people in Washington. And I know, like for example, with all these murders backed up, we have extra extra expenses at the jail because we've got a lot of people incarcerated. Do you see? costs like actual financial costs for trying to work through this uh this backlog uh going forward is that is that something that you know we're going to see costs involved with as we try to catch up from covid you know that's a good question um we did you know we did get a lot of cares money earlier for computers and it and so that that is an issue in terms of upgrading our stuff because you know one of the things you know not necessarily COVID related but i know most of the you know with the COVID money, we had a bunch of departments get body cams. I mean, the sheriff's department and everybody else, well, body cams, we've got to now access them, share them and, and get involved much more in technology. We had Grand Rapids was in like, you know, one for the last four years and boom, all of a sudden we got like seven and trying to handle those evidence.com and having computers like this that can handle um, downloading and the stores and stuff like that, that we may use in, in cases down the road. So you, that could definitely be something, you know, technology wise. You know, witnesses in and stuff like that. You know, I, that's a good question. I'd have to take a look at and really see, and how long. I mean, I don't know when these cases are going to come to trial. That could be another two years down the road for some of these. So it, there, I would assume there would be costs to quantify it. That's going to be more difficult. Uh, yeah. One other question: uh, the how much? I know that partly this depends on on funding, but if funding was out of the picture, do, would you see a lot of potential for the sort of the treatment courts? Um, to grow, or rather, how would you judge the potential? Do, could we do sure. twice as much? I mean, what's your feeling? That, that's more of a manpower issue, too, just because, you know, judges have only a certain amount of time. I know 63rd is talking about doing a, a drug court, so there's an expansion there. Um, I think there's probably room for a mental health court. You know, the Commissioner Stack, you know, a misdemeanor. We've got a, a felony mental health court, and now we got a juvenile 
but there's a lot of misdemeanors that come through that, you know, we can't refer to mental health courts. So there is room. It's just, you know, part of it's funding, but part of it is the manpower in terms of getting judges. And once again, then my prosecutors. So at some point in time, yeah, we may need funding for additional people. Um, we've always talked about an IT person too, you know, just going back to the body cam and stuff like that. You know, IT does a nice job of support, but having someone in the office that can handle evidence.com and body cams, and we're going paperless. We're going paperless. Uh, so Carpel, and that's a whole different issue. And that was through a capital fund through the commission, we're very appreciative, but there's going to be issues in terms of how we deal with that paperless function going through. So an IT person, so I could see more manpower down the road to help support all this. Thank you. Thank you, Chair. Yep. Any other comments or questions from commissioners? Uh, I don't see any. I did have a follow up, uh, Chris, with respect to that issue on uh, the backup of the uh, of the jury trials, which, of course, is being experienced in the civil side of that as well. But um, is that a noticeable increase in the uh, in the number of individuals incarcerated? Because I assume that at least with respect to a number of the felony cases, these individuals may continue to be incarcerated at our jail uh, pending those trials. I don't think so. No, I, if you look, I haven't ran the numbers lately, but last time I checked, we were about 800 in the jail and we usually average about a thousand to 1100 because judges are making, you know, they're trying to be COVID conscious as well in terms of setting bonds, which is somewhat concerning because that's, you know, people are out that may have normally been in. I'm actually keeping a, a bond list of, okay, cases. I had a one guy, you know, charged with drunk driving. He's a sub four, so he's got four prior felonies charged with drunk driving. He got a bond and was out and guess what? Committed another drunk driving. Uh, so he's got drunk driving, you know, five and six now or whatever it is. So we're, we're seeing people out on bond more that maybe would have been locked up for this because of COVID and because people are worried about the delay. So I, I you probably talked to the sheriff a little bit more, you know, okay. exact number. Last I checked, our numbers were down in the King County Correctional Facility. And once that, uh, that backlog uh, breaks, that is the courts begin to actually schedule jury trials. Uh, I have to presume that your staff is going to be even busier because obviously yes. a trial is a very time consuming process yeah we're kind of there you know, we had a preliminary meetings with the circuit court and right now we're kind of i don't know if you remember back when i first started we used to have a you know they pick you know they have a jury trial set for monday tuesday wednesday and then you kind of have a rotating and that got you know it was very inefficient and you bring jurors in they didn't like it so we went back to just monday you pick you know monday's trial starts they're talking about doing that again going to the three days a week just trying to move the cases get through the clog um and so that's you know if six judges do it, there's two attorneys per judge. Meanwhile, we got to cover all the, the normal preliminary exams and so forth and warrants. It, it'll be, we'll be stretched thin. So speaking of stretching thin, one of the byproducts from my experience, when you ask attorneys to take too many cases, it can create a burnout factor. Have you experienced that at the prosecutor's office or have you avoided that? I really don't think so. We've done, I've actually brought some people in though. We've had some trainings in the, in the past year and just before COVID about turning the mental health uh, just for that fact. Um, you know, I, I haven't seen it. I don't think so. We're, you know, we don't see a mass exodus. We're not seeing, you know, we, our average is about 15 years, I think for experience. So people are sticking around here. You know, you see other, I was asked to pre present at PAN because uh, you know, we have a great retention. So if people were burning out, I think they'd be leaving. And I, I just haven't seen that yet. And I, I think we've got a pretty good office attitude. So, but we'll, I'm, it's something to keep an eye on because just what you said, we don't know what's going to happen when this all breaks. It's probably that fancy building we put you in over at 82 Ionia. <laughs> exactly. <laughs> all right. Any other questions or comments uh, for the prosecutor? I don't see any. So thank you so much for your report, Chris, and thank, thank you, you for, for all your work and uh, pass our, uh, our gratitude on to your entire staff. We'll do. All right, let's move to the next item, which is miscellaneous. Uh, any commissioner have a miscellaneous item to raise? I don't see any hands. <laughs> up, so I will assume not. I do have just a couple of items uh, just to report in uh, with respect to the status of our um, legislative priority statement uh, that is uh, scheduled to go to this committee on March 23, our next meeting. 
And uh, so it's the intention that we would be taking the initial statements uh, that we think are pretty refined, uh, get them to the uh, commission or the uh, committee for their approval. Uh, there are a number of other issues that still are out there uh, being evaluated. And my intention would be to schedule a work session for the, uh, for the commission later on to address those and uh, whether we move any of those into a, uh, a formal statement. Uh, and if so, what that statement would, would look like. So we'll be dealing with those later on in the year. And then just a reminder that we have another work session coming up on the 23rd dealing with this uh, performance measurement review process and, uh, and how that can best be uh, informed and whether or not we look at any changes on that. So that's coming up. Uh, if there is nothing else, uh, we do stand adjourned. Thank you all for your time.